Inside the Magic Show number 473 for April 27th, 2014. It is Sunday, April 27th, 2014. This is show 473 of Inside the Magic. And as always, I am your host, Ricky Briganti, with a whole lot of Disney and theme park news and plenty more fun. And before we get to all of it, I invite you to visit our website at insidethemagic.net. There you'll find all of our podcasts, videos, photos, news, articles, and plenty more. And if you ever have any news, tips, questions, comments, or anything else, you can always email me at ricky at insidethemagic.net. Or you can call and leave a message at 407-494-4ITM. That's 4486. And now, let's get on with the show. This week's episode of Inside the Magic is brought to you by Magical Travel. Book your summer Disney cruise with Magical Travel and receive a shipboard credit to use while you're on your vacation. You're going to want to book now for the best availability and pricing by calling Magical Travel today at 866 207 8387 or visit them online at magicaltravel.com to receive a free price quote and when you do that be sure to mention inside the magic to receive a free disney gift card for qualifying bookings when you book your disney vacation with magical travel and uh, thanks very much to all contributors to inside the magic whether you're uh, making a donation one time or recurring or just clicking through any of the affiliate links found over on inside the magic.net it all supports this show and i thank you very much for all of it and now let's get started with a trip around the world Starting out here at Walt Disney World, I was really, really hoping to be able to tell you all about the Seven Dwarves Mine Train this weekend. There were a pretty was a pretty big possibility that it was going to soft open. However, nope. Yeah. Not quite there yet. The Imagineers are still uh, putting the final touches on this ride this weekend. They've had this sort of massive contraption covering one of the ride vehicles or the, or the mine trains, uh, sending it around the track, checking for clearance. It, it looked like almost something out of a horror movie, this big metal thing <laughs> covering sort of the semicircle thing covering the vehicles uh, making sure that uh, you know if anybody were to stick their arms up in the air or perhaps even stand up which you definitely shouldn't do while you're on the ride but if you did they want to make sure that uh, there's lots of clearance so that nobody has any uh, accidents uh, so they're working on that uh, one of the final bits of testing I believe that they'll be doing uh, certainly coming up in just a few days is the big press event uh, at Walt Disney World not only for Seven Dwarfs Mine Train but also sort of unveiling officially My Magic Plus and Fast Pass plus and a whole lot more uh, should be pretty exciting this coming uh, Wednesday Thursday and Friday uh, Disney however is still not calling it a grand opening for Seven Dwarves Mine Train just yet uh, they're calling it a dedication on Friday uh, which means that even after that takes place and there's sort of the big grand hoopla marking the occasion uh, it won't necessarily st- be open at that point it, it seems like it's still a little bit touch and go at this point to see when exactly this attraction is going to officially open to the public, but there's a real good chance uh, that any time in the next few days it will uh, it will open at least for a little while, and uh, I will definitely get to ride uh, as part of the event. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, telling you all about it next week. However, uh, construction walls are completely down around the attraction. You can head over to InsideTheMagic.net and take a look at what it looks like from the outside, and then uh, come back very, very soon to see uh, the rest of it, what it's all about. Now, speaking of My Magic Plus and Fast Pass Plus, there's some changes that are being uh, going into effect tomorrow, Monday, April 28th. It's something I talked about, I believe, on last week's show that, uh, that Disney had announced that they're making uh, changes to Fast Pass Plus already. Uh, after you select your three Fast Pass Plus uh, selections in advance or when you get there for the day and you've used all three of them, then you're going to get the opportunity to go to one of the kiosks in the park and select another. Uh, Fast Pass Plus reservation. Then once you've used that, you can go back and do it again. And after you've used those three as well, you'll be able to pick it for any park. You'll be able to park hop. It doesn't have to be contained within it. Uh, now, the downside is that you can't use the app to do any of this. You actually have to go physically to the kiosk to make these selections. So uh, that may change in the future. That's just how it's going to work for now. I'll definitely uh, try it out sometime within the next few days and see how all of that shapes up. 
Now, also happening this week is the 25th anniversary celebration of Disney's Hollywood Studios. That's uh, May 1st. And uh, surprisingly, Disney is not including it as part of the press itinerary. Uh, there's a lot of other things going on that day uh, re- with related to uh, Seven Dwarves Mine Train. So uh, those uh, who are part of the press event, the media here to cover all of that, are basically going to ignore Hollywood Studios, which is you know, a little bit odd. It's a, it's a nice milestone, 25 years. Uh, but I'll, I'll certainly uh, uh, try to have somebody over there to cover the happenings, which will be at 10 a.m. Mickey and Minnie Mouse, uh, along with the park's vice president, Dan Cockrell, will have a small uh, rededication ceremony of the park to honor 25-year cast members there. And then uh, cut to later in the evening at 7 p.m., there will be a Stars of the Studios motorcade with Captain Jack Sparrow, Darth Vader, Doc McStuffins, Wreck-It Ralph, Vanellope, Sophia the First, and other characters uh, motorcading down Hollywood Boulevard. And then in the at the end of the night will be a special fireworks show at 9.30 p.m. So uh, lots of uh, extra entertainment for that 25th anniversary. Now, of course, coming up shortly thereafter, uh, later in the month of May, will be Star Wars weekends, and Disney has finally announced the full celebrity lineup for this year. In addition to uh, voice actor James Arnold Taylor hosting the event, uh, Ashley Eckstein will be there as well. Of course, she was the voice of Ahsoka Tano in The Clone Wars. She'll be uh, hosting, or or will be in a Behind the Force show uh, featuring the cast of Star Wars Rebels, which is uh, coming up soon, and uh, the cast will be sort of uh, sprinkled throughout the weekends. Uh, weekend number one, May 16th through 18th, we'll have Ahmed Best, who was the voice of Jar Jar Binks. Uh, Peter Mayhew was there, uh, will be there. He, of course, was Chewbacca. Uh, and uh, Vanessa Marshall will be there, and she's one of those new names to the Star Wars universe. She'll be in Star Wars Rebels, the new animated series. Uh, she, her character is Hera Syndulla. Then uh, weekend number two, May 23rd through 25th, Warwick Davis will be there. Of course, he was Wicket, the Ewok, as well as uh, had a small part in uh, episode one. Jeremy Bullock will be there. He was Boba Fett. And here's another one of those new names for Star Wars Rebels. Tia Sirkar is the actress name, actress's name. Uh, she will be playing Sabine Wren in Star Wars Rebels. Uh, weekend number three, May 30th through June 1st, Ray Park's going to be there. He was Darth Maul. John Ratzenberger is going to be there, which is kind of a stretch in the world of Star Wars. You know him, of course, from many uh, Pixar films, as well as uh, a lot of other things like Cheers. Uh, but he, in uh, Star Wars uh, Episode Five: The Empire Strikes Back, had a very small part. He was Major Bren Derlin. Uh, you probably don't even remember that he was in the movie. I certainly didn't. So he'll be there. And then another Star Wars Rebels cast member, Taylor, Taylor Gray, who is playing Ezra Bridger. Then weekend number four, June 6th through 8th, this is going to be the big, big weekend. Uh, Mark Hamill is going to be there. Luke Skywalker, of course. Uh, And then uh, uh, Ray Park will be there again, Darth Maul. Billy Dee Williams will be there. Of course, he was Lando Calrissian. And then another, uh, well, a repeat Star Wars Rebels cast member, Taylor Gray, will be there once again. Then finally, uh, since it's extended this year to five weekends, June 13th through 15th, D. Bradley Baker uh, will be there. He was uh, Captain Rex and some clones and some other characters for the Clone Wars, uh, his voice. Uh, Kat Tabor uh, will be there. She was uh, uh, Padme Amidala in Star Wars The Clone Wars, along with other characters. Tom Kane, Yoda in The Clone Wars. Matt Lanter, who was Anakin, and other characters in The Clone Wars. Steve Blum, who was Zeb Aurelios in Star Wars Rebels, or will be that character. So a uh, pretty big lineup for that last weekend as well. Lots to look forward to throughout Star Wars weekends. Disney also announced a new nighttime event for Star Wars weekends called the Feel the Force Dining Event. That will include reserved viewing for the Legends of the Force Star Wars Celebrity Motorcade at 11 a.m. with some beverages and snacks to enjoy. Reserved viewing for the Symphony in the Stars fireworks at 9.45, along with a Star Wars-themed dessert party that's going to include Darth Vader cupcakes. And you'll get a special Disney Photo Pass card that has a series of complimentary Star Wars photos. Now, all of this costs $54 for adults and $32 for ages 3 to 9. Now, some big, big, big Imagineering news came out just a couple of days ago. 
Uh, Scott Trowbridge is a name, or Trowbridge, uh, you might know his name from the world of Universal uh, Creative, Universal Studios. He was most notably the producer of The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man Ride, which is still a fantastic theme park attraction. But in addition to that, he's also worked on, you know, he worked on the development of Islands of Adventure in general and many, many other projects over the years. Well, just a few years ago, uh, actually it's been quite a while, 2007, Walt Disney Imagineering got him to come over to them. Haven't heard his name too much since then, but now... Now, he has been tapped as the head of what Disney is calling Star Wars Studios. Basically, he is in charge of developing Star Wars for the parks. That's pretty exciting news. We don't know any specifics, of course, but there's something in development, and uh, he'll be the guy behind it all, and and definitely a good one uh, to be at the head of that now. On the flip side of that, Tom Fitzgerald, uh, that's an Imagineer name you might be familiar with. He's been there for years and years, decades. In fact, he's one of the top executives of Walt Disney Imagineering. Uh, He worked on uh, uh, the original Star Tours, the revamp of Star Tours, and many, many, many other projects. He is actually not working on uh, the new uh, Star Wars studios that I mentioned. Instead, he is now going to be overseeing uh, Epcot attraction development. That's right. I actually said Epcot. Uh, That means Disney is putting one of their head lead Imagineers on the project of Epcot in general. So uh, we should be expecting some pretty big things to come for that park in the coming years. Um, So some big moves for Walt Disney Imagineering. Now let's jump over to Universal Studios Florida with a little update to the original Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Uh, Of course, Diagon Alley is on the way to Universal Studios Florida, and with Diagon Alley will come the uh, Weasley's Wizard Wheezes store. And uh, because of that store being uh, on the way, the Zonko's Joke Shop is now no more. Uh, Universal has reopened that part of the store as an expansion of Honeydukes, the sweet shop right next to it, so Zonko's doesn't exist anymore. Honeydukes reaches all the way through with the candy jars everywhere and lots of uh, green paint on the walls and uh, a lot less cramped quarters in there as well. All the uh, merchandise that was in Zonko's is going to be available over in the other half, the Diagon Alley half of things, along with a whole lot more as part of the huge Weasley's Wizard Weezes store uh, that will be opening this summer. Let's hop out to California for some, uh, here's some pretty exciting news. Uh, you know, I get the question all the time as I'm going around to, uh, uh, you know, pretty awesome special events, uh, press events, that sort of thing. People ask me all the time, how do I get to do that? How can I go? How can I attend? Uh, well, I actually have a good answer for you for once. Uh, this week, uh, Disney Interactive is holding a special event in Hollywood, California to introduce the next version of Disney Infinity, Disney Infinity 2.0, the video game that will be introducing Marvel characters into the world of Disney Infinity. Uh, We will certainly be there to cover uh, the event. Uh, I'm sending Jeremiah Dawes because I won't be out in California because I'll be in the midst of this big Walt Disney World press event, but you can be there as well. I'm running a contest over on InsideTheMagic.net with 10 winners that I'll be sending to the special event that's taking place uh, at the Pacific Theater Cinerama Dome on April 30th uh, in the morning, and you and a guest, if you are a winner, will have a chance to see Disney Interactive President Jimmy Pitaro, as well as Marvel Chief Creative Officer Joe Quesada, and uh, plenty of press, of course, and uh, the big reveal of uh, what it means for Marvel to be coming to Disney Infinity. Pretty exciting. So head over to InsideTheMagic.net ASAP, because the contest is ending tomorrow, April 28th, because I need to give them some advance notice of who uh, the winners are, so they can get your names on the list, so they can get you in. Um, and if you do win, make sure you get back to me ASAP with your uh, information, so I can forward it on to Disney Interactive, so they can get you in. So uh, definitely head over there as soon as possible, if you are in the Hollywood area, there's no travel, no transportation, none of that. You have to get there yourself. Uh, but yeah, I will. I will get you in the door if you uh, if you win the contest. Lots of entries so far, so uh, so good luck. Uh, you'll see it on the uh, Inside the Magic homepage. Now, here's a little bit of uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios news to the to turn to movies now. Of course, uh, later this year is their big feature film, Big Hero 6, which we haven't really heard a whole lot about. It's been quite a while since we've heard anything about it. Well, this week, uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios announced the uh, short film that will be played ahead of Big Hero 6 is something called Feast. It's going to first debut at the Annecy International Animated Film Festival on June 10th. Uh, it's directed by Patrick or- Osborne, who was also the head of animation for Paper Man, which was fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, Disney's description of Feast is the story of one man's love life as seen through the eyes of his best friend and dog, Winston, and revealed bite by bite through the meals that they share. 
interesting concepts. Uh, of course, Big Hero 6 and now Feast will hit theaters on November 7th of this year. Speaking of movies, Disney Channel has announced Teen Beach Movie 2 is coming. Uh, it will uh, have the cast of the original Teen Beach Movie returning uh, and is set to premiere on Disney Channel in 2015. Now let's turn uh, to the world of Star Wars, where here's some news that has caused a bit of an uproar this week. You might be familiar with the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Um, there's, there's the Star Wars movies, right? You know those. You know those stories. Well, then there's the rest. There's comics and books and video games and all of that. And moving forward with the new trilogy of uh, Star Wars movies that's coming out, a lot of people have been wondering, are they going to incorporate any of this expanded universe, uh, these stories, these characters, into the new movies? Well, uh, Disney and Lucasfilm have come out and said there is now something called it's a Lucasfilm's story group that is trying to unify the expanded universe across films, TV, animation, uh, comics novels and games um, they're going to make it uh, as they put it consistent and cohesive uh, the narrative across all of it uh, it seems like they're trying to sort of pull in the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, 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 model and make it all make sense together which the Star Wars Expanded Universe hasn't really in the past there's been sort of bits and pieces here and there but they don't all gel together as a result of that they've basically said that everything that's come in the Expanded Universe before doesn't really apply moving forward um, they might take bits and pieces of it and use it here and there, but none of it is canon. None of it is is something that you can look to and be like, oh yeah, this movie's based on this because this is where the story's going. You don't know where it's going to go because none of it really is official. So that's essentially what they've said, that the Expanded Universe is something that fans have enjoyed for many, many years, but at this point it is just that. It's it's almost you know a notch above fan fiction <laughs> at this point. Uh, maybe a little bit more than that, but... Um, it's something that they definitely have said that they're going to uh, continue to utilize in the future and just want to make sure that all of it makes sense together instead of being def different stories all over the place, which makes perfect sense to me. I never really got into the Expanded Universe uh, at all. I've really just kind of seen the films and I've played a few of the video games, but uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how it all kind of mashes up in the future. Now, here's something I want to play a little clip of for you, a, a, a song that has shown up on YouTube that a few people have sent me this week that's uh, pretty uh, amusing. Uh, you know the old show, DuckTales, of course, from the Disney Afternoon, one of my favorites of all time? Well, uh, here's a slow jam version of DuckTales. Life is like a hurricane here in Duck. Race cars, lasers, airplanes, it's a duck blur. You might solve a mystery or rewrite history. That is just fantastic. You can find the uh, the whole version of that uh, on YouTube. You just search for DuckTales Slow Jams or, or check this week's uh, show notes and you'll certainly find it there. And last bit of news this week is just uh, some uh, Inside the Magic news. We have reached 200,000 likes on Facebook. So uh, thanks uh, very much to uh, to everybody who has been uh, following along on Facebook. It, it, in fact, we surpassed 200,000. It's like 202,000 now or something. Uh, so keep, you know, if you're, if you're not already following us on Facebook, uh, definitely do so as well as Twitter, YouTube, and all that good stuff for, uh, for everything coming up. Particularly, follow along this coming uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday because because uh, not only are we going to be talking about uh, Seven Dwarves Mine Train, a lot about that, interviews, uh, the ride itself, the queue, and everything surrounding it. Also, uh, sort of the insight behind My Magic Plus and Fast Pass Plus, as well as uh, some other fun surprises uh, that will be uh, happening throughout those days. So uh, definitely stay tuned for all of it. And that'll do it for your news from around the world this week. It's a 
Now, last week on the show, I had mentioned uh, some issues that were going on with uh, Anna and Elsa debuting over at Princess Fairy Tale Hall at the Magic Kingdom with Fast Pass Plus, some bugs associated with their appearance. Um, uh, and also, it seems that there have been other sort of miscellaneous bugs here and there with uh, Fast Pass Plus, where things, you know, reservations have changed or disappeared, or you couldn't get make them in the first place because of, you know, just because of an assortment of bugs in the new software. Well, um, the My Disney Experience app has been updated since then uh, just a few days ago and they specifically noted that uh, the new version of the app was uh, fixing fast pass plus bugs um, so my tip this week for you in sort of relation to last week's uh, adventure and tip is to update that app as much as you can whenever there is a new version because uh, things are not uh, entirely perfect at the moment um, in, the, in the world of uh, Disney's newest uh, system but they they're getting there you know the official rollout is imminent and uh, from there I'm sure they will continue to tweak it as needed to uh, make sure that everybody is uh, on the same page when it comes to all of it, but it's always a good idea to have the latest version of the software. Of course, if you're like me and you uh, have an iPhone, you're still on OS 6, iOS 6 instead of 7 because you don't like 7, uh, the look of it and all of that, well, you're kind of out of luck because the app doesn't work with the older version, uh, so you just have to use the mobile site. And then, well, anyway, that's another story for another day. <laughs> everybody else out there, email your tips into tips at insidethemagic.net. Now it is time to talk a little bit about Star Wars because at the beginning of this week, I was actually out in California in the Disneyland area, uh, Burbank, Glendale, hopping all around. Uh, courtesy of Disney Store, who was hosting a uh, special event to unveil their new line of exclusive Star Wars merchandise that will be coming out, when else? May the 4th. That's the beginning of the merchandise. So it was a, definitely a whirlwind trip. It was flown out there, had uh, a few stops along the way, and then came right back and, and reported on all of it along the way. So for those of you who didn't uh, tune into all of it or want to hear just a little bit more about what I had a chance to do, stay tuned here because I have lots to share. But before we get to uh, Star Wars, I actually just want to talk a little bit about uh, my brief visit to uh, to Disneyland, which is always a you know always a nice thing. Uh, just to, to head over to Disneyland, spend a few hours there, see what's new, see what's interesting. Kind of a brief trip report here of sorts. Some of these things I've talked about before, um, but uh, I had a chance to go on the newly updated Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, which is wonderful. Uh, I really enjoyed the upgrades that they have added to uh, to that attraction recently. I went on it both during the day and at night and saw the new special effects, the explosion effects and smoke and rumbling. And boy, is this thing loud. I think it's actually louder from outside the attraction than actually when you're riding it. Because in the distance, when you're walking around Frontierland, you just hear this noise. And you're just like, what in the world was that? Oh, it's Thunder Mountain. It's, it is indeed thundering now, so um, it's pretty cool. I definitely uh, would recommend next time you're at Disneyland, go ride it multiple times. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, quite a treat now. I, I, I would love to see that type of uh, those types of effects to make their way out here to uh, to Walt Disney World uh, instead of just an interactive queue. Uh, of course, you can see video of uh, that experience over on our YouTube channel. Uh, in addition, I uh, wandered through uh, Fantasyland to check out Anna and Elsa's meet and greet out there. Hadn't seen that in person yet. Of course, I didn't actually get into their meet and greet because uh, when I got over there midday, the line had already been cut off for the entire day. Um, and it had been cut off for a couple of hours already uh, just because it's the same thing out there as it is out here. A crazy popular meet and greet. Um but I did get to see the Olaf uh, audio animatronic that's outside their meet and greet, which is wonderful. He was, you know, looking around and, and saying funny things. And uh, I, again, something I wish we had out here at Walt Disney World. It's nice that Anna and Elsa, you know, are here, but they're kind of just stuck in Princess Fairy Tale Hall. I would love to see something a little bit more themed, like uh, Disneyland has done for them, which is uh, which is really nice. Over at Disney California Adventure, I saw the Maleficent uh, movie extended preview, which we do have out here. Uh, in Orlando at Hollywood Studios. However, it's not the same. Out here, it's basically just, here's the preview in 3D, the end. In California, there's fantastic special effects because it's uh, in the uh, Bugs Life, uh, Bugs uh, Land 
uh, theater for its stuff to be a bug. And uh, you're utilizing all of the effects in there, you know, lighting and wind and water and smoke, and it really enhances. I, w I wish I could see the whole movie like that. Of course, you can't, but at least enjoy that while you can, um, because, uh, you know, and the movie looks pretty good. I don't know. I'm undecided about whether Maleficent's going to be a, a really good movie or just an average movie. Seems like uh, Angelina Jolie is going to be great in Maleficent. I'm not sure about the rest uh, of everything, but uh, I don't know. We'll wait and see how the movie turns out. But at the very least, uh, California Adventure, the preview is fun. Now, as it turns out, the day I was at Disneyland with the Disney Store uh, folks, I was uh, actually there on the uh, 50th anniversary of uh, the 1964-65 World's Fair, the actual day, uh, to the day of when that opened, which was pretty cool because so many attractions uh, at Disneyland originated there. So I made sure to uh, visit uh, Inventions, which used to be the Carousel of Progress, which used to be you know, at the World's Fair, at least that's where it debuted. Of course, now the Carousel of Progress uh, slash Inventions is really the... Stark Expo, more or less, because there's Thor and Captain America and Iron Man in there. So, uh, you know, all of that is, uh, is is happening there now. But, you know, I made sure to say, hey, happy 50th anniversary to what used to be there. Uh, as well as I wrote It's a Small World, which is very much uh, almost the same as what it was uh, many years ago. Also, I uh, wrote on the uh, Disneyland Railroad to see the Primeval World, which was a part of an attraction at the World's Fair. Uh, so that was nice. And then, of course, uh, I didn't actually go into great moments in Mr. Lincoln because I went on a time crunch and unfortunately I didn't but I did I made sure to walk by and look at the sign and at least say a happy 50th to that attraction as well so that was kind of fun uh, to see all of that uh, you know a bit of a as I said kind of a, a bridged trip to uh, to all of that but it was it was nice to see at least a half a day at Disneyland now let's talk a bit about Star Wars. It was a very small group of uh, select media. Uh, it was uh, just a couple of Disney websites as well as a bunch of uh, Star Wars uh, blogs and websites that were there to see this unveiling from Disney Store about the, the exclusive Star Wars products that are coming soon to those stores. The Disney Store, of course, is what I'm talking about, is the stores that are in the malls near you. They're everywhere. And uh, I had a chance to go to Disney Store headquarters, which I'd never been uh, to before. It was pretty cool. I had a chance to uh, walk around a bit take a tour of it it's it's in it's really a uh, surprising location it's a, a warehousey feel very open um, not like individual offices it's very open uh, there are cubicles but they're uh, completely open of course there's toys everywhere absolutely everywhere in Disney store products um, lots of you know fabrics and uh, swatches and artwork and um, you know just things everywhere as they're as they're designing it uh, one of the really cool things that I saw was if you've been to one of the newer Disney stores the imagination park stores you know there are the trees and the walls and all of that have uh, projections. Um, well, all of those projections are run simultaneously across all of the stores out of one central location in the main Disney Store headquarters. And you, they had displays there on the wall, just sort of regular uh, monitors that showed what was playing in all the Disney stores simultaneously everywhere. So that was kind of cool to see uh, all in one place. But, uh, uh, you know, I didn't really see anything uh, too uh, sort of hidden or secret as I was walking around. If I did, I couldn't really talk about it here. I did go into their mock Disney store, uh, which is what they sort of use to set up what the next uh, sort of uh, layout's going to be for the new product. So I saw a few things there that I can't talk about just yet. Some things for, you know, Maleficent, things for, you know, things like that. Nothing nothing too groundbreaking, but, um, you know, interesting products that are on the way. But the real point of being there was to uh, see Star Wars products. And uh, before I get into talking a little bit about what they did unveil... I want to bring a brief interview, uh, bring you a brief interview with uh, one of their toy designers. His name is Brian Ewing, and uh, here's what he had to say about uh, Star Wars coming to the world of Disney. How long have you been working on Star Wars products for Disney Store? Uh, about a year now. Okay. Since, since they got the license, so I think we've been doing it about a year, yeah. And uh, you know, Star Wars has obviously been infinite merchandise over the last few decades. Uh, bringing it to Disney Store, how do, you, how do you sort of take your own take on that? Well, trying to delve into, I mean, everything's been done, obviously. You know, you look at all the product that's been out there, so we try to take it to, like, the action figures we did, try to bump up the size on them, really uh, integrate good articulation points and the sounds and the lights and the details at, at, a, at, a, at a scale that we don't think has really been done before. Right. Um, the die cast are the same thing. They're, they're a larger size that we really haven't seen before. So trying to just take all the things I've learned over the years and get the details I want in it and really being a stickler for the the accuracy of it, the integrity, the toy, the integrity, the character, or the vehicle, or the spaceship, or whatever you're doing. So just yeah. trying to really 
focus on clean, perfect aesthetics, right? It's well, in, in that respect, are you are you aiming at Star Wars fans, making it accurate for them, or are you aiming at Disney fans? Are you aiming for the general audience? Pretty, pretty much trying to get everybody, the whole demographic of Star Wars. Like, you, you want to appeal to kids, because that's probably the main audience is to sell it to children, and right. so they enjoy playing with it and like it, but still nicely detailed enough where adult collectors like myself would want to buy it. So right. if I, I'm pretty much designing things for myself in the detail-oriented part of it to where if I know if I wanted to buy it, I'm hoping other people would want to buy right. it too. So. No, I, I think the line is a, it's a good assortment of a little for this person, a little for that person. I'm particularly drawn to the die-cast vehicles. I think those are great along with the little <laughs> the little figurine packs are interesting. I don't yeah. know that I've seen Star Wars products packaged that way before. It's, yeah, I don't know if I have either. It's, it's usually, you know, of course we've seen the, you know, the three and a quarter inch figures for years and years and years, and those are very articulated. These are, you know, what, what was the goal to? I mean, I know Disney has been releasing these figure packs for years. Is that sort of your your method? Is now bringing Star Wars into that Disney way of doing things? Oh yeah, yeah, because our, our PVC sets, figurine sets, are very successful. So trying to capture the different scenes and moments in Star Wars with the six packs are just great. And they're, I mean, they just infinite play value for kids and their imaginations to take these really detailed figures, even though they're not articulated, they're fixed posed, but right. they're dynamically posed. We even try to take the poses of them and do them differently than other people have done and really search out the movies and what's been done to try to come up with our own poses through our sculptors. Well, it's really interesting to see those figurines not as animated characters, too. These are real, you know, the live action movie. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember too many of those figurine sets based on live action. Yeah, I've seen some things over the years, but it's been few and far between, so yeah. it's just a nice little refresh that we're being able to do them and such. So. How, how do you um, avoid stepping on the many other companies' toes who are making Star Wars products, particularly you know Hasbro with their extensive line of figures. Well, like I said, it's just trying to hone things to what's good for us and try to be unique as we can and take if we're doing action figures what has everybody else done and how can we do our own action figures that aren't being what Hasbro's done and just create our own line like the size like our talking action figures are much larger um, the diecast vehicles are much larger and different articulations and, and things like that um, so it's just it, it's hard because so much has been done but you know it's, it's, you gotta just take your stab at it so it's out there and and uh, try to do what you can. One, one more question. What would you say to the hardcore Star Wars fan who was worried that Disney's going to ruin everything Star Wars because they're Disney? And <laughs> Don't worry about that. It's not going to happen. I promise we're going to do fantastic product and you will all want it. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I, I believe him when he says that because um, it, it, it was clear to me in talking to many people there that there were a lot of Star Wars fans. Uh, even the uh, uh, VP of, uh, of Disney Store, the big, big Star Wars fan. Uh, so they, they want to do it right. And I heard us talk about a few of the products that they had unveiled there. Let me go into a bit more detail about them. Uh, the first one that they had uh, brought out were these large articulated figures, very uh, little, uh, shiny, plasticky sort of figures, which maybe the downside of them, but other than that, they look great. Very great likenesses. Um, I, actually, let me take a step back here. All of the products that they're coming out are based on the original trilogy, which is nice. Uh, they're kind of ignoring the prequels for now, uh, especially with you know seven, eight, nine. The movies, uh, episode seven, eight, nine, on the way. They really want to build off of that and go back to that original four, five, and six trilogy, and just kind of put the prequels to the back burner for the moment, which is nice. So um, this uh, these figures that are coming out with are are like twelve to fifteen inches tall or so. Uh, pretty big figures that look really great. The sculpts are fantastic. It's uh, uh, Stormtrooper, Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader. Uh, coming soon will be Chewbacca and Boba Fett after that. They showed some prototypes for those. Um, these figures are fully articulated. They uh, have sounds, a huge variety of sounds, uh, actual clips from the movies, as well as uh, other features like they, uh, you know, light up lightsaber and that sort of thing. Here, let me play a clip of what these figures sound like. You stand guard. Yes. Give me regular reports, please. If you only knew the power. You guys, she's perfect. I Not a bad bit of rescue, sir. Hey, Luke. May the force be with you. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster in your side, kid. You okay, R2? Good. Hey, wait, let's close it up. We're going in, we're going in full throttle. Now that we can do some hard stuff on our back. 
Really nice assortment of clips there. It's not kind of not your standard audio clips that you would hear in a toy. They really mined the Star Wars movies for some more interesting clips, longer clips. The sound is fantastic. They're very, uh, very loud. Um, the the it's not these little you know tinny speakers that are on so many toys. They actually sounded really good. Uh, so you know I, I would have to praise them for all that. Pretty pretty high quality uh, toys for a very reasonable price. I think those are uh, only thirteen bucks each for some large items. Uh, like I said, the only sort of downside to them is they do look a little plastic. But that's, you know, they're a toy. They're meant for kids to play with, not necessarily uh, for collectors to just put on a shelf and look at, though I'm sure that will happen uh, uh, plenty as well. Uh, and, and actually, I'm sorry, those are uh, those are, those are $30 each, um, not, not $13. Uh, they will be, at least when they come out. Uh, $13 is the price for the figurine sets um, that I, I was talking about there with the, uh, the toy designer. Now, these figurine sets are great. If you've been to Disney Store over many, many years, you know these sets. They're these little um, sort of bubble packaging that you see there, and it shows uh, it's a whole bunch of characters that are not articulated. They're fixed figures, but they're in really uh, animated type of poses, really expressive poses. And, uh, you know, it would be for many animated films over the years. They've done it for just about all of them. Well, now they're taking that idea and applying it to Star Wars, and the figures just look great. They've got uh, lots of you know familiar and favorite characters from the original film trilogy. Each of there's three different sets separated into the three different films, and they're all sort of playing iconic moments from the films. Uh, you, of course, you, you know you've got Luke Skywalker and Han Solo, and uh, Slave Leia's in there, and Jabba the Hutt, and uh, you know Han and Carbonite, and Stormtroopers, and and uh, just everything in between. It's uh, some really nice figurine sets. Those are thirteen dollars for those sets. Just little PVC figurines. Definitely Definitely a collectible item there. Uh, another item that really impressed me that I'm definitely going to have to buy a few of these was, uh, as we mentioned, it, some diecast vehicles. But these are diecast vehicles like no other that I've seen because you know normally you think about uh, a diecast, you're thinking like like Hot Wheels or Matchbox or you know smaller vehicles, um, diecast being metal uh, figures. But no, these are big. These are like the Millennium Falcon, hugely detailed, and it's maybe like six inches in diameter, uh, maybe even a little bit bigger. They're they're massive diecast and and. I I only got to see prototypes that were in plastic, so I didn't really get a sense of how much they're going to weigh, but I imagine they'll be pretty hefty once they're fully uh, realized in the metal um and that they're going to be producing them in, and that not only do they just sit there, but they're also sort of little features like opening cockpits or doors, or like there's a there's an ATAT or a, a speeder bike or um, you know X wing and and Tie fighters, and they all just look uh, look really wonderful. Lots and lots of detail. Um, uh, you know, it's something that certainly collectors will want to uh, to pick up, and they'll look great uh, on a shelf. I think some of the biggest uh, die cast uh, uh, that I have personally uh, ever seen. Disney Store also showed off some plus items. Uh, the, some of them are already in store, some that are coming soon. There's a Tauntaun and a Jawa and an R2-D2 where you can actually swivel the head. It's not too often that a uh, plush figure uh, or, you know, a plush doll or whatever you want to call it um, has an articulated point on it, so that was kind of nice. Uh, there's a Bantha as well, so they tried to sort of pick out the, the ones that aren't as common, you know, really go for uh, some of those uh, the uh, the characters that you don't see quite as often, especially in a in a plush form. Um, surprisingly, the out of all the pictures that I posted, out of all of this, the one that got everybody's attention the most, the one that kept getting retweeted and reposted and talked about, were character mugs that are on the way. I guess mugs are a huge thing. Um, they're you know they were uh, mugs that are uh, fashioned after the characters of Star Wars, so, you know, Darth Vader mug and a Luke Skywalker mug and a Chewbacca mug and a C three PO mug, and you know they're I mean, I can't say too much about it. They're ceramic mugs um, that looked really nice. The paint job was nice. The colors really popped. And uh, definitely an, an item that I think uh, if you if you collect mugs or you just need a new coffee mug, they would work out pretty well. Disney Store was also showing off their role play costumes for uh, Star Wars. Of course, uh, you know, much like Disney princesses with their dresses, well, Star Wars has Darth Vader and Stormtrooper with, um, you know, pretty these, these are for kids. They don't have adult costumes. Um, but for kids, they're, you know, decent. They're probably a notch above your average Halloween costume. They're not exactly perfect. Don't expect a full plastic uh, or, you know, PVC or whatever material uh, the cosplayers make their Stormtrooper outfits out of. They're still, you know, sort of flexible, fabric-y material, but they're shiny, and they try to make them as detailed as possible. They had mentioned, like, uh, the, the metal chain that goes around the neck of Darth Vader is something that they worked on for a while to make sure that that was on there, and it looked and felt like metal, but it also wasn't 
you know, any sort of choking hazard or anything. So um, that's, you know, uh, something that is, is rolling out in the stores. They also showed us an early uh, prototype of a Star Wars Rebels costume that uh, they just got their first version back in uh, from from production to, you know, sort of tweak it and move on from there. So that's on the way. Lots of Star Wars Rebels merchandise ahead. I've talked about a lot of that already from uh, from Toy Fair um, uh, a couple of months ago. So, um, you know, lots of uh, Star Wars. Uh, this is just the beginning. This is all sort of launching in Disney stores and malls all over the country May 4th, uh, May the 4th. And uh, it's definitely just the beginning of their Star Wars line. They were kind of showing off their attention to detail and their, uh, you know, basically trying to make them as accurate. And uh, as, as he said, as the uh, toy designer said, trying to appeal to all audiences, whether you're a kid playing with it or you're a collector and you want to own it. I think it's um, I think it's good, a good start. I, I, don't, I didn't really see anything that was necessarily a high-end collectible, but I did ask him about that. And they said it is something that they're definitely talking about for the future, that there's a possibility for, you know, for example, there are the Disney princess designer dolls that have come out that have been hugely popular. Well, imagine not necessarily that exact same thing, but imagine that type of a collectible, a higher end collectible from the Star Wars universe coming out of the Disney store. That is definitely a possibility for the future. Uh, now, to launch all of this at the Disney stores uh, throughout the country, there will be special events beginning May 4th and then continuing on select days after that. If you, uh, They're going to have giveaways of free pins. There'll be inflatable lightsabers there'll be a special uh, medal that you can uh, you can get and wear whether you're a your kid an adult whoever's participating in all of this so you can go to your local disney store on may 4th to uh, to get all of that and and to commemorate the the launch of uh, of uh, all of this sort of this new franchise of toys for Disney Tour. Now it's it's interesting, uh, sort of the mix of everything that's there now. Because now you've got you've got Disney, you've got Pixar, you've got Muppets, you've got Marvel, you've got Star Wars. They're really running out of space in these stores. And I asked them, you know, I asked uh, Jonathan Story, who's the VP of uh, of Disney Store. I asked, you know, how, how do you fit all of this? How can you possibly work all of that in and then also add in the really popular things like Frozen and upcoming Maleficent and, you know, whatever else is a more timely thing? And he said that is their biggest challenge is they only have so much space in every store. And uh, to be able to fit everything that they want to in a physical location is really, really difficult, especially when things are flying off the shelves like Frozen merchandise. And, you know, then you end up with stocking things, but then it's gone right away. And what do you fill that space with? And it's a, a, an incredible challenge for them on a... A regular basis to figure out what to put where um, we walked through a local mall's Disney store and uh, you know if you've been to one of these newer uh, stores you know there's this sort of winding sparkly path through the store well you get about halfway through and the path kind of takes a turn every store has that and where it takes the turn that's what they call their sweet spot it's there that they feature uh, sort of the most prominent the most important the most selling merchandise and that's where when it's in stock frozen merchandise currently is but they're also rotating it out with other things like summer is coming so the little mermaid sells really well for them a um, Maleficent's on the way, as I mentioned a few times here. And so uh, they, they have to constantly rotate this merchandise in and out to make it make sense in each of these uh, stores, which is uh, you know a little bit of business of what goes on in the Disney stores. There will uh, be more Star Wars uh, showing up in, in all the locations in addition to all of these other properties. There will be Star Wars clips available in the sort of the interactive video screens that will be appearing there. Uh, whenever the Episode 7 trailer or teaser comes out, that will certainly be playing. Uh, music will uh, be throughout the stores. In fact, he said there's uh, some sort of custom music that's being made just for the Disney stores that'll be uh, very Star Wars and uh, playing throughout to really bring Star Wars in a big, big way to Disney store. That was kind of the whole point of this event is to make it very clear that uh, Star Wars is huge for Disney and they're going to try to do as much with it as they possibly can to really make fans happy and uh, I, I certainly got a sense of, uh, of a lot going on there. Now, for those of you wondering, I mentioned Frozen a few times here, what is going on with Frozen merchandise? Why is it so difficult to get? Well, they They've been restocking it actively. In fact, this week, uh, more shipments have been arriving at the Disney stores. From what I've heard from people after you know publishing the article about this, I've gotten some feedback from people who, based on that, went to their local store, and sure enough, there was frozen merchandise, and it sold out in like three seconds. Uh, there were people lined up in the morning. They had to do lotteries for dresses and this and that, so it's still flying off the shelves just as fast as they can put it there. And uh, Disney is really trying to crank it out as quickly as they possibly can, uh, but with hundreds of stores and uh, thousands and thousands of people wanting it all, it's just very difficult. Um, so uh, if you're if you're upset with them because you can't get a, an Elsa dress or, or a doll or whatever, they they are uh, as as they you know basically said they're doing their best to crank it out. They said they were had high expectations for Frozen. 
and the expectations uh, were, were even though it was very high it went even bigger than they ever thought it would and so uh, they were even not exactly ready for the phenomenon that Frozen uh, was but they have said they already are developing more products for Frozen not just the current line which is you know rolling out to sh- uh, shelves as much as possible now but there's going to be more on the way in the near future and certainly as Christmas gets closer there'll be more toys and all of that uh, that they're definitely not done with the Frozen line of things so look for more and more to come uh, in the near future. Now, one of the things that I, I know a lot of people wanted me to ask about and, and people wonder about is why isn't there more for adults in the Disney store? And uh, really, the answer that I got was not a great one. It was that if because of the limited space in the stores, they really have to focus on the children's items. And that's the point of the Disney store. For adult collectibles, they have just essentially put them on DisneyStore.com. And that's where you can find them. Uh, they said that there are certainly adult items there, you know, items for adults, collectibles, and uh, adult apparel and that sort of thing but it's not something that they really want to stock and, and take up valuable limited space in the stores so I, whether you like it or not that's their response that's their answer that's the direction that they're going in with the mall store so don't expect to see uh, much for adults in those stores uh, anytime in the near future uh, you're really just gonna have to look for uh, look on the website um, you know I had brought up to uh, to Jonathan's story uh, the concept of of Disney side or Disney bounding you know uh, using characters as inspiration for outfits and wondering if Disney Disney store had any plans to develop a, in a line of apparel that was based on you know characters not costumes but just sort of inspired by or influenced by the looks and the colors of characters and uh, he kind of looked at me like I was crazy <laughs> apparently he had never heard of these concepts before um, so yeah yeah it's uh, clearly they're focused very much on children and and what they do for kids and not so much what's going on in the world of adult collectors which is unfortunate for you know adult fans of Disney but uh, kids are really where they are uh, setting their sights and where the stores are going. So uh, that is is about it for uh, talking about the Disney stores themselves. However, I do want to mention one other really uh, cool thing that I had a chance to do as part of this uh, grand Disney store uh, two-day event out in California. They also brought our small group of press to uh, the Walt Disney Studios, the movie studio, which I had been there briefly many years ago. For those of you uh, who have been with Inside the Magic for years and years and years, you remember I was in the um, uh, Imagineering Imaginations competition uh, even before I started this podcast, but I'm sure I've talked about it on the show before. Um, it, it was a, I had submitted a project you know, when I was at the tail end of my college uh, career uh, to Imagineering and became part of that competition. Uh, during that, back in, gosh, it's been like 11 years now, I had a chance to go to the studios briefly because that's where the award ceremony was. Well, this is the first time I've been back to the Walt Disney Studios since then, and this time I got a proper tour uh, uh, from one of their tour guides, and joining uh, us on the tour was Steve Sansweet. You Star Wars fans will probably know that name. He is uh, the owner of Rancho Obi-Wan, who is the official record holder of the world's largest Star Wars collection. Uh, in addition to that, though, he uh, has worked at Lucasfilm in their marketing and fan relations department. He's uh, written or co-authored 16 Star Wars books. He helped create the Star Wars celebration events. He helped launch StarWars.com, and so he's been a big part of Star Wars over the years, and so he was there walking around uh, being a Disney fan <laughs> with the rest of us and learning about uh, sort of the history behind you know what the Walt Disney Studios was for the last uh, you know eight plus decades and where it's going now that Lucasfilm is part of it, and that was kind of the culmination of a day walking around the lot and seeing all kinds of cool stuff uh, uh, going into the, the ADR room where they've recorded uh, all the Pixar dialogue and uh, lots of uh, dialogue for just about every major Disney movie. They said Angelina Jolie was just there the other day recording for Maleficent and all of that, saying, seeing locations where they filmed Saving Mr. Banks and all of that, but the culmination of all of it was seeing, uh, at least the outside, of uh, the Lucasfilm office at Walt Disney Studios. There's a big Lucasfilm sign, there's Star Wars posters, there's a statue of Yoda, Kathleen Kennedy's office is there, and we didn't get to go inside, of course, because there's lots of secret stuff going on in there, but at least I saw the outside and uh, sort of, you know, appreciated where Disney has been, the animation studio, and the live action studio, and the sound stages and everything, and where it's going with uh, Lucasfilm. Uh, in the immediate future. So uh, if you want to see photos from all of this and some video from all of this, from the products to the Walt Disney Studios tour to a bit of Disneyland, uh, head over to InsideTheMagic.net and check out all the articles that I've published there. And uh, definitely go to the Disney stores on May the 4th to see all the new Star Wars products. Hey, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hey, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hey, Ricky. Ricky, this is amazing. 
ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Inside the Magic Listener Feedback. Time for a little bit of listener feedback before wrapping up this week's show. First up is an email from Rob from England who writes, I've been listening to the show for a couple of years now and a big fan. In July this year, I'm coming to live and work at Walt Disney World, working in the UK Pavilion at Epcot. I've been to Disney and Universal plenty in the past, but I'm curious about other attractions in and around the Orlando area. Do you have any recommendations of things to do that are maybe a little bit different from the standard theme park fair? Uh, Rob, great question. Yes, there's plenty to do around Orlando. Of course, uh, you you mentioned... uh, Universal and Disney. Of course, there's SeaWorld, and if you want to drive a little bit further, there's Busch Gardens over in Tampa. Those are the major uh, theme parks of the area, but I'm sure you're plenty familiar with uh, with all of that. One of my favorite things to do around Orlando is certainly mini golf. There's lots of mini golf to be found, and not only Disney's and, and now Universal's, but also lots on International Drive and just kind of here and there around the city. Um, those are always fun. Uh, some are better than others, but, you know, it's mini golf, and it's something that I always enjoyed when I used to be, uh, you know, a tourist coming to Orlando. I would make sure to hit at least one or two mini golf courses every time that I came here. That's always fun. Uh, International Drive is something you can certainly drive up and down and see lots of, uh, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's very touristy. You know, it's changed restaurants and that sort of thing, but you will find some interesting things that are unique there, and certainly um, depending on when you're coming, uh, I guess you said July this year, eh, it sounds like it's too early for that, but they're working on some pretty big stuff as part of the uh, the uh, iDrive uh, 360 project there, but that's that's a ways away. I think that's not opening till next year, so you'll be here a little, a little too early for that, but... Um, you know, that's uh, just a, a little bit uh, over in uh, Old Town on 192. You can explore that a little bit specifically to check out the, uh, if you're into the Halloween side of things, Legends, a haunting at Old Town, the year-round haunted house that's there. Um, and, and actually, I'm glad you mentioned this because I just found out a little while ago that I am going to be at Legends, uh, the Old Town haunted house, this coming Saturday, uh, which is May 3rd. Uh, on the evening, if you uh, go to that haunt that night and tell them uh, the code word, code phrase, happy birthday, Eric. Uh, You will get half off your admission that night, and you'll see me as one of the characters uh, inside haunting the place up, along with a few other fellow website owners and bloggers. Eric actually refers to Eric from uh, Behind the Thrills. Uh, It's his birthday this week, uh, and uh, in honor of that, we're sort of uh, doing this special event over there. That should be pretty fun. So uh, I probably should have mentioned that earlier in the show, but I'm glad you reminded me of that now. So come see me say hi anyway um so that's that's uh, certainly something fun to do um you know there's it's it's tough to sort of give a generalization of other things that are different and fun to do because i don't know your preferences there's a lot of uh, you know smaller exhibits and museum type things you know titanic exhibit and all of that but it's all it's all a little bit touristy i don't know if that's what you're looking for uh, certainly up and down 192 you'll find a lot of that up and down i drive you'll find a lot of that uh, what i love to do when i go into cities um it doesn't have to be orlando it could be anywhere uh, i love finding sort of the local flavor of food and uh and and you know things that are um not necessarily tourist traps but uh you know sort of the the local hangouts and this and that so uh, my favorite way to do that is to just pull up uh online and and you know you know pull up a google map and just search for food and coming up around you at any moment you'll see lots of dots and you can kind of click on each one and then find things that are unique to where you are um i you know it's hard for me to recommend specific things in certain places because i know your transportation situation if you're on the international program might be tough for you to get around and that sort of thing but um you know as it gets closer if you want more specifics i can definitely put together a more complete list but there's some some general ideas of what you could do David writes in and says, uh, I've been listening to your podcast for about three years now and always gets my week started on the right foot. First off, I uh, I wonder if you know how crowded the Universal Orlando parks get the days after Thanksgiving. My family is from Miami, but I live in London and I'm visiting for Thanksgiving. We're thinking of driving up to Orlando Thanksgiving night and going to the parks Friday through Sunday. I'm worried the Diagon Alley opening will add some crowds and wonder if uh, three or two uh, days is sufficient to cover both parks. We are a large group of ten adults and celebrating my engagement while we are there. Also uh, wonder if uh, any details of a two-park ticket is required to experience the Hogwarts Express attraction. Uh, David, first up, congrats on your engagement. And uh, yes, 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 it will be very crowded. Uh, That's one of the most crowded times of the entire year. Uh, Add to that Diagon Alley, and yes, yes, it will be very, very crowded, unfortunately. Um, You will need a two-park ticket to uh, uh, see both sides of uh, the Wizarding World as well as ride the Hogwarts Express. 
so count on that. And uh, if you really want to see everything, two days is minimum for sure. Um, you might have to spend one entire day just devoted to Harry Potter, let alone everything else that's there. Uh, so yes, uh, unfortunately count on some pretty big crowds that weekend um, and, and there's really no way around it just kind of knowing that go into it uh, accepting the fact that you may not see everything and just kind of focus on the most important things all right let's go to a voice message hello this is jeremy calling once again from the neverland podcast uh, I have a fun story I want to share with you. Uh, I volunteer here in Missouri at a state park called the Watkins Mill State Park. Uh, the Watkins family owned a woolen mill here, uh, kind of uh, well, well on the uh, the west side of Missouri, kind of up towards the north half, uh, just north of Kansas City. Well, uh, I was uh, working or touring rather uh, the ice house that's on the property. See, they they still have the home for the Watkins family near where the mill is that you can actually come and take tours on. And uh, so we do this thing called Spring on the Farm, and I was volunteering, and so they assigned me to the ice house, as I said. And uh, so really I needed to be able to explain how back in the 1800s how people would cut ice from the ponds and how they could store the ice in this pit. And I said, well, what a great way to actually explain this, but to uh, ask everybody if they'd seen the movie Frozen and uh, to, to recall the first five minutes. And I tell you, this was a great success, although there were some people that had not seen the movie, but uh, there were these two little girls that when I had mentioned Frozen and talked about the first five minutes, they were so excited, and they been began spotting the tools that were inside the ice house, the saws and the tong and the ice plow. And they were like, oh, that's what they were using when they were cutting the ice, and they picked it up and they pulled it on the cart, and their ice just lit up. And uh, so I was actually pretty thankful I was able to use Frozen and Disney to actually teach history to uh, the children there. So uh, great, wonderful experience. Had a good time. Uh, really, really exhausted from it. But uh, it was really great fun to be able to use something from Disney to be able to teach history here in Missouri. So no you I'd share that. All right, everybody have a magical day. Bye-bye. Born of cold and winter, air and mountain rain combined. This icy force, both foul and fair, has a frozen harbor mighty. Hopefully we're singing the song while you were giving the instructions. A great story. I love that, uh, that you're able to, uh, you know, as I've said in recent uh, weeks here on the show, make it Disney. Take something that's definitely not Disney at all, but turn it into something that's uh, really fun. And certainly you got through to some kids who otherwise would probably have been bored out of their minds learning about ice ing ice harvesting and you know but all it takes is one really really popular disney movie and suddenly everybody's uh, very interested in that sort of thing so uh great story thanks uh thanks very much for uh, for sharing that here and uh, i guess next time you'll have to talk all about uh somehow trolls the rocks coming to life yeah maybe not maybe not so much all right, let's do one more email and then wrap things up here. Michael writes in and says, I've uh, been, been enjoying your podcast for a few years now. It gives me something to look forward to on Mondays. I'll be turning 50 on October 1st this year, and I've talked my wife into taking me to Walt Disney World to celebrate. I'm a big fan of both the Magic Kingdom and Epcot, and knowing that both parks will also be celebrating birthdays, I was wondering if you had any advice about which one would be best to spend that day. I would prefer to go to Magic Kingdom, but I don't know what to expect in the way of crowd levels, having only traveled there during the summer in the past. Well, uh, Michael, happy early early birthday to you and uh, generally speaking if it's not a major anniversary year um, Disney doesn't do a, a whole lot or really much of anything to celebrate uh, if there was any chance of anything happening as far as a birthday celebration it would probably be at the Magic Kingdom something pretty brief um, so if you're looking for that sort of thing that would be where you should go however uh, beyond that uh, October 1st not a terribly crowded time of the year so I think you can definitely enjoy being here without worrying about it uh, being overrun run by uh, a tourist or anything like that. There will be a Halloween season, so that certainly draws uh, some people. And uh, it's worth looking into whether or not that particular day will be a day for Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party. But uh, other than that, um, not too much else to uh, to think about and worry about other than just uh, enjoying your birthday and having a wonderful time at Walt Disney World. And that'll do it for uh, listener feedback this week.
hopeful tomorrow. So there's a whole lot to look forward to in the coming days. I cannot wait to finally ride the Seven Dwarves Mine Train this week. It's been years in the making and uh, just waiting and watching little by little all of New Fantasyland come together and then uh, the building of, of the mountain and this cottage and the track and watching them test it and finally it's all coming together and I, I look forward to uh, talking all about that next week along with uh, all the other fun, uh, you know, the debut of, uh, officially of My Magic Plus and Fast Pass Plus uh, should be interesting to learn more about that and any other uh, topics that uh, Disney will be unveiling. They're going to have a presentation and uh, one of their famous Around Our World presentations, which they could uh, announce something new. So I'll have to wait and see if they do that or just kind of rehash what they've already talked about. Um, you know, like I said, a lot to uh, look forward to also coming up in the very near future for those who have been following along uh, outside the magic, the other uh, sort of subsection of Inside the Magic, uh, talking about uh, things that aren't exactly uh, Disney and not always family friendly either. I got a, a project that I've been working on for that um, for the, uh, quite a while now. So uh, that's coming up in the near future. So those of you who are interested in that side of things, definitely stay tuned. Uh, something pretty fun going to be posted there this week. Uh, of course, I do want to thank Magical Travel for sponsoring this week's episode of Inside the Magic. You can find out more about their services by visiting MagicalTravel.com. And uh, between episodes of this show, definitely visit InsideTheMagic.net. That is your source for Disney and theme park news. And as where you can find all of our podcasts and videos and photos, news, articles, and plenty more. And certainly follow us on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, particularly this week with so much ahead. Uh, I'll be posting uh, quite a lot beginning on Wednesday for the uh, couple of days that follow. So uh, make sure to follow along all the social media to uh, stay on top of all of it. So thanks to all of you for listening each and every week. And have a magical week. Bye. Shining at the end of every day. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow Just a dream away